and I am back. So I am in the chem fizz for biological systems, passage one, and for whatever reason, my thing got over recorded or something. So I will just reshoot this for you all again. So um, here are my scores, and I really wanted to emphasize this really quickly. But here is my dashboard, and you can see that on the first diagnostic exam that I got for the MCAT, or for the next step MCAT exam, I have a 514, which if you look at the MCAT Reddit is representative of like a 520 if you um, extrapolate the data, which looks fairly good. I mean, if you are um, trying to study for the exam, I would hope to say that it's a score that most people would be satisfied with. But there, I know there are a lot of other smarter people out there, but that's just my personal scores. And I wanted to show you something that I think you guys might find interesting. So at the beginning of summer, at the beginning of summer, I took a half-length diagnostic practice exam next step. And I won't be going over AMC because I don't know if they have a copyright or if they have material that um, we are not allowed to show, nor do I want to spoil the questions for anybody. But here you can see clearly that at the beginning of the summer, I got a 505 on the practice exam, which is indicative of essentially... Wow, look at the psych score. I must have guessed pretty well. <laughs> but um, essentially, it's representative of the fact that, you know, um, this was not a score that I wanted. I'm not, to, I'm not trying to say that 505 is a poor score, but in fact that it was not the score that I wanted, and it was a score that I think most people um, starting taking off the exam, starting the exam would be satisfied with, or this is like a starting point, a 505 which is a little bit better than the 50th percentile. So what you see here is my first diagnostic of which we are going to be looking at a little in a short while. And I'll be looking at the chem fizz section in because that is my forte. I'm not going to try to tell you about cars because cars is not my forte. I don't want to tell you guys things that are um, blatantly wrong. But here are my results from last summer in which I tried to study for the exam myself without taking biochem. Now, if you see here, it's a 482. Now, notice for biology and psychology, I was probably I had like a severe mental block because uh, looking at the scores, I only took, I only did three questions, and I only I didn't do any of the psychology. But you can see clearly that my cars was right on average. It was right on par with being average, and that's where I started last summer. I mean. I don't know how else to put it, but I just started at average. And for my chem fizz, the sixth percentile. Now, I'll have you know that I did, I believe I did almost all the questions. I skipped two for whatever reason, but I answered these three. And that means that my score for chem fizz was really not that high at the beginning uh, when I started studying last, last summer. And it's really difficult, I think, to start um from such a low basis it just doesn't feel good you know so that's where i started that's where i want you guys to know um where i began my journey because i would be lying if i just told you that all of a sudden i just started doing really well because that's not how it happened clearly the 121 doesn't um i mean it, it speaks volumes so anyways we're just going to hop into the mcat and notice I will be a little bit faster with this one because I have seen this once because my last video of me. I'm not going to go over the questions. You can go over the questions yourself. It's going to be the same type of mentality. I'm just going to break down this passage for you. Um, this, the mentality of going through every answer, reiterating why every other answer is wrong when you get the question right, and also comparing answers when you remember that you were deciding between two of them. So without further ado, chem fizz questions one through five. All right, oral drug delivery systems are limited by a short gastrointestinal transit time leading to low bioavailability. Drug delivery systems able to retain a dosage form in the stomach are needed. Research into floating drug delivery systems may satisfy this need. All right, so in my mind, I have an idea of somebody taking a drug into their mouth and it's going to sit in their stomach and then it's going to pass into their intestine. Now, the problem with this is the bioavailability. So in my mind, I'm also thinking this drug doesn't sit in the stomach for a long time. So if, if for whatever reason, let's say this drug needed to be activated by a low pH, or for whatever reason, it could only pass through stomach cells, you know, for whatever reason, they're trying to extend that time 
that this drug is in the stomach. And that's what I got in mind. I just got to keep that main idea in mind. So they're going to try to um, rectify this problem by investing in a floating drug delivery system, which I'd imagine is kind of like, you know, like a little boat. It's like floating on top of the stomach. So FDDS can be approached by using either effervescent or non-effervescent techniques. Ideal effervescent techniques achieve floating duration times of grading the 16 hours in the stomach. Effervescent FDDS incorporate gas generating agents which provide buoyancy. Newer drugs focuses on non-effervescent systems where the swelling of polymer is joined to the drug and traps air within the polymeric matrix, providing buoyancy to the dosage form. So here, FDDS can be approached by two techniques, one that creates bubbles and one that does not create bubbles. Um, effervescence, in my mind, is just kind of like the fizzy drinks that you open when you open a soda. It's effervescent. Um, how I know that? I don't know, just maybe reading somewhere randomly. Um, ideal effervescent techniques achieve floating duration times greater than 16 hours. So remember before they were talking about low bioavailability in the stomach. So now they're talking about extending bioavailability via an effervescent technique. Notice that is effervescent and non-effervescent. They're trying to draw distinctions between these two different modes of delivery for increasing the buoyancy. So in my mind, I have two categories. We have FDDS broken into effervescent and non-effervescent techniques. Now, I go on to the next sentence. Effervescent FDDS incorporates gas generating agents which provide buoyancy. So like I said before, effervescence is when they're bubbling like a soda. So it makes sense that effervescence would use gas. But in the next sentence, newer research focuses on non-effervescent systems where the swelling of polymer is joined to the drug and traps air within the polymeric matrix, providing buoyancy to dosage form. So in this one, I'm thinking about you know, polymers are um, basically made of multiple subunits of carbon and or not necessarily carbon, but they're made of multiple subunits. And I like to think of latex as a uh, terpenoid, um, a terpenoid polymer. Um, when I think of polymers, I just think of a whole bunch of groups and I'm thinking kind of like a buckyball. It's not it's not really like a buckyball shape of carbon, but it's just like expanding out like a little bubble. I shouldn't say bubble because it's not generating a gas, but it traps air inside and it makes a float, kind of like uh, you could think of the cargo of a ship, how or the bottom, the hull of a ship. At the very bottom, they have little chambers. Um, I believe in the Titanic where they tried to keep air in so that it would help increase buoyancy because the row of air, the density of air, is less than that of water. So. You can read all this stuff afterwards, but notice I'm taking a sentence by sentence. If you have the time to take a sentence by sentence, I recommend it to you all. All right. A study was performed at anti-diabetic sulfonylureal glipizide. The drug and one of three polymers are mixed in a mortar according to blah, 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 blah. A drop of water was added until a homogeneous paste was obtained. The mixture was then placed in an oven at 50 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes to remove water. The compound was then compressed into tablets for serve as a basis for drug release and buoyancy measurements. So... What I want you to get out of this part of the passage is that half this paragraph is basically a recipe for creating their drug delivery system, or it's not even drug delivery, it's how they like mix the drug. So I would not focus a lot of my attention on this. Notice in the back of my mind, I'm thinking critically, and um, if I were to come up with a question, it would be really hard to have a critically thought out question, I believe, for just a recipe like when they just blatantly say oh yeah okay so they're going to mix it smash it and then put it in water you know there's not much that they can really test you on so in the back of my head I take a breather I relax and this is where I would just um, take a deep breath so to speak so remember the main idea is that they're just using a drug and they're just telling you anti-diabetic sulfonyl urea glipizide and the most important thing is this picture right here, this table that follows right after. So essentially, the only thing I can think of is needed until a homogeneous paste was obtained and they heated it to remove water. So in my mind, maybe they can ask me a question about um, coordinate covalent bonds with water. They can ask me about like MgSO4 coordinating water. But outside of that, I have no idea what they can ask me. But this table, this table is a treasure trove of information. So just looking at it, I try not to look at the caption first, especially when I'm practicing because it helps me give practice. And um, I like to explicate or say the what I believe the table is trying to tell me. And yeah, that helps. I noticed that they give us the bulk densities of multiple drugs. 
And that's important because what you can imagine in the stomach is that the stomach is just like a giant bowl of water. And maybe it's a little bit more acidic than water generally. But if I drop all these drugs in at the same time, notice that I can get a clear separation of the drugs. And that, that my friends, is the type of thing that I would imagine eggs show up on a uh, test question. In fact, if I recall correctly on this question number one, it was exactly what they're looking for, which to my discredit, I guess, or to my credit, I don't know, I got the question wrong. So you can see that it was a pretty hard question. If I recall correctly, this was like just density. Essentially, they're going to say to test in vitro drug release of solid dispersion that tablets were placed into dissolution vessels containing 900 milliliters of hydrochloric acid. So they're going to test it in vitro, meaning they're testing it in a petri dish. They're going to have drug release of solid dispersions, meaning they're probably solid tablets. They're placed in a little vessel, so just like a cup, and they added a little bit of acid to it. The solution studies were carried out for one hour with samples withdrawn at predetermined intervals. Drug concentrations were acid using the HPLC method. The dissolution experiments were carried out in triplicate and the results are shown in figure one. So we're saying the dissolving studies were carried out for one hour and the samples were taken out at in, um, times that they already agreed on beforehand. And they're saying that they use the drug concentration to determine by HPLC, which in case you don't know, is high performance liquid chromatography, which is essentially just another separation technique that is used as very similar to TLC. So the dissolution experiments were carried out in triplicate. So they did it three times and the results shown. In vitro buoyancy was also tested. So they also tested um, when they were in the petri dish or inside their dissolution vessel how buoyant it was so essentially the force that it felt upwards tablets were placed in a vessel containing the HCl okay wow I thought they just said that okay so sometimes when this happens um, I like to rethink about it. tablets are placed in a vessel containing 500 milliliters of 0.1 molar HCl the time taken for the tablet to rise to the surface of the dissolution media and the total duration that the time remained on the surface were recorded so the time taken for the tablet to rise to the surface, so if something's more dense, I would expect it to take more time to rise to the surface because um, it's going to experience a greater force of gravity down. Notice that if each tablet was the same volume, each tablet was the same volume and they were all completely submerged, they would all experience the same buoyancy force because the volume displaces the same. However, the retarding force on this way upward would be the weight of gravity pulling down these tablets. So that's what I have in mind when it says the time taken for the tablet's rise surface um, was recorded. I was just looking at this graph. Again, this graph is full of information. Trial 1, 2, and 3. Just right off the bat, I noticed that I'm going to probably be comparing trial 2 and trial 3 in comparison, noticing that the glipizide release was a lot lower in trial 3 for whatever reason than trial 2. So if I go back and look at trial 2, I notice that, okay, here's uh, 